what I want to talk about is um, some lessons from other regions that, that, that have got extractive industries and talk about issues to do with the social impacts, basically pointing out some of the things that have started to, I think, become clear through the other speakers, and I hope I don't end up repeating too much of things that other people have said, that, that any in industry brings with it benefits, risks and costs, um, that, that social impacts are particularly hard to define, so the sorts of concerns about uncertainty that we've been hearing today apply in this area as well. Um, but that it's never all good or all bad. And uh, so, so unfortunately, there is a balancing act to be, to be made, and that's where it becomes very unclear to be able to work out uh, what the balance is. If it were all good or all bad, we'd have no difficulty making these decisions. Um, that resource extraction, we've certainly heard this a few times today, creates jobs, but on the other hand, it depletes the labour pool um, for other industries as well. That mining and coal seam gas extraction can bring benefits, but they are not equally spread. Again, a message we've heard uh, a couple of times today. That both of them provide these industries, do tend to add to the infrastructure in regions, but it will be very uh, infrastructure skewed to the production needs and the soft infrastructure, if you like, and, and the social needs may often be neglected. And that the social changes accompanying extractive industries can affect, uh, we were getting at this question a little bit uh, in the previous session, can affect social fabric and can affect the psychosocial well-being and identity of communities and of individuals. And that those effects are not something that we should dismiss without understanding uh, what we're, where the costs and trade-offs are. So how might we apply those lessons to ensure a basically, as much as possible, positive transition for our region? So uh, um, when we want to talk about the, the, the possible benefits and, and uh, ways we might sustain our regional communities through development of a particular industry, we do hear, and, and have seen figures on this today, about the comparative value of production that we get from, for example, mining and agriculture. Mining in the broad uh, ABS figures that's uh, talking about all extractive industries. So, no question, if you just say, which one adds most to GDP, mining and agriculture, well, with it, mining is winning hands down in Western Australia and Queensland at least. However, the conventional proposition that a region needs an industry that brings jobs and economic growth and better infrastructure and that's all it needs to deliver is no longer enough to secure what we call a social licence to operate, to satisfy the people of that region that this is uh, an a beneficial course for them to follow. So we have to work out how do we instead think about these trade-offs if the only things we're going to look at, if, if jobs and GDP and more infrastructure are not the only things we're going to look at. So at uh, the Centre for Social Responsibility in Mining, we often take an assets-based approach. So most people will be familiar with the idea of sustainable development as a triple bottom line approach where we need to look at the environmental, the economic and the social. But there are other um, ways of dividing these things up, one of which is sometimes called the Pentagon of Assets or the Five Capitals Model. So this says that any region has and any communities have a number of sets of assets, human, social, the human uh, assets or your human capital is the skills, the health, the uh, knowledge that people have that helps them to earn a living, have a good quality of life, have a good future. The social assets that we have are the links and networks and connections that help us to be able to improve um, our life and live a good life. The built environment is obviously um, buildings and structures, but also tools, technology, those sorts of things. 
Um, the natural capital, we, we understand that's our environment, the water, the, 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 the air, the, certainly the uh, resources under the ground, the land itself, the trees, etc., that we can convert into other forms of capital. And the economic capital, the, the financial assets that can be, again, used to generate and convert into various kinds of capital. And we actually um, quite often would add an extra category, the cultural capital, which is the symbolic things, the things to do with, with um, sense, sense of identity, the things to do with our heritage, our culture, etc., that we, again, regard as important and are able to use to add value to our life. So the important thing about all of these capitals is that we need all of them and um, we, we can in fact approach it in a way or should be aiming to approach it in a way that maintains our stocks of all of these things or if possible increases our stocks of all of these things. And we had it earlier that in terms of our natural, in terms of our national budget, we shouldn't be living beyond our means, living off the capital. Well, we would say in terms of all of these assets and these different forms of capital, we shouldn't be doing that either. We don't want to deplete the stocks of capital, just the flows that are happening, if you like, the interest, the return on those assets that we can, yes, keep uh, using because all of these forms of assets can be transformed into the other forms of assets. But arguably, at the moment, we're very busily transforming almost all of them into economic assets as fast as we can and not worrying about some of the other sorts of transformation. So is there some way where we can think in terms of how do these things contribute to all of those and make sure if they don't deplete them? when we're going down a particular course of development because development is not sustainable if we're liquidating all our assets rather than adding value to them. So I'm not an economist uh, and I'm not even a journalist who doesn't want to be called an economist but I do want to think in terms of not liquidating our assets but instead trying to build them. So to the, to the lessons that we can draw and, um, and the first few are very general, and then I will take some that uh, draw on case studies and do tend to overlap, even though the case study is uh, a different one, uh, do tend to overlap with the messages we've been hearing today. So first, the issue that any industry and any uh, change of direction for a, a region is going to bring both benefits and costs. In fact, of course, not changing direction can also bring benefits and costs and risks to your region and they can have just as dire a consequence. But at any rate, any industry is going to occupy some land, disrupt natural ecosystems, it's going to use water, power, um, energy, etc. It's going to have some impacts on your environment. It's also going to employ people, it's going to pay royalties and taxes, it's going to patronise local businesses to some extent, some businesses somewhere. It's going to earn export dollars. So it's going to have an economic impact and it's going to affect people's quality of life, how they live, how they work, how they relax, how much time they have to do all of those things, how they interact with each other. It's going to have social impacts. <coughs> Pardon me. But those social impacts, and this is the second lesson, are very hard to define and measure. We've been hearing today that actually we haven't got all we need to define and measure some of the other things that actually are at least potentially hard science. But when you get to social science, because they involve human experiences of change, there's never going to be a complete set of undisputed and, and uh, totally certain data. So we need to work out what's our strategy going to be. Well, we need to first of all measure the things that count, not necessarily what can be counted. We've got to think of what are the important indicators to people of community assets and well-being. 
How do people measure these things and think about them? And what can we find out about what's happening to those important indicators? Um, social responses are less objective and standardised, certainly uh, less predictable than biophysical ones. So it's pretty important for us to use qualitative measures, not stick only to quantitative ones. But we do have to work out some strategies for separating anecdotes from evidence and not bundling together bunches of anecdotes and saying I've got whole lots of qualitative evidence here that such and such or such and such is true. In point of fact, um, qualitative researchers tend to say, if what you're setting out to do is find out what's true, then you sort of, you're starting on a, on a quest uh, hiding for nothing. Because there isn't actually, when you get to people, people's perceptions, people's feelings, people's reactions to things, and impacts are not about objective change, but about how they're experienced by people, then you're never going to be able to get a, a truth that everybody would agree on. With social stuff, even when you are working in areas where clear variables have been defined, and it's still very difficult, and, some, and they may be measurable ones, but it's still very difficult to isolate them from each other and from the context and from the interactions that, uh, that occur. So this, some of these problems, and this is definitely one of them, uh, is also experienced in a lot of environmental science, of course, and there they've had needed to adopt a systems approach. And in social science, we need to do the same thing. And then the final point I put it there is that social uh, effects tend to aggregate and to interact with each other. And it's cumulative measures that we need of some of these things. It's not little discrete measures. So we don't want to go out and measure how has the human capital of Barcaldon increased or, you know, and then say, well, we'll do that by saying what's happened to the education level of people here over the last 50 years and think we've had a, a sum and think that gives us a sum picture of what the imp improvement in human capital or in well-being and, and cumulative community assets has been over that time. We have to think of these things more holistically. Um, the next issue does return to the idea that anything will have effects, <coughs> impacts, and picks up the notion we've heard a few times, it's never all good or all bad. Um, so. This is a diagram, that, a, t a table that's taken from a number of social impact assessments that have been done where people have had to work out, well, so, so for a number of mines, it's mine, not coal seam gas, that we've got down the, uh, the, the various rows, each represent a mine, and the various uh, columns each represent a particular kind of social impact, and I hope that you are able to, to read them. But, one, one thing that we can see from this, this table is that while things will have an impact, it's sometimes not clear that that, whether that impact is good or bad. So this table has put ticks when they think there's going to be a positive impact and put crosses when they think there's going to be a negative impact. But in some cases, they've just got an arrow to show you the direction they think that impact is going to go in. And in this case, demand for housing, almost exclusively people said demand for housing when there's a new mine or an expansion happening is going to go up. And John's just pointed out that that's one of the, the key things that is a concern and, and, and frequently found. For some people, developers, some, you know, the people in the accommodation industry, the motels, the caravan parks, etc., that's a positive. They're going to get more business. For others, it's a negative. They're not going to be able to afford to live there because the prices of accommodation are going to go. So the low paid workers, it's a negative. So we can know the direction of the change, but working out the balance of whether that's good or bad is a much more uh, challenging exercise. As well, uh, we, we can find out that, that there are, though, some areas where they suggest, in, min, in most cases, the results are fairly positive. So there, in most cases, there's going to be an increase in jobs 
in most cases, there's going to be an increase in economic benefits. In other cases, there's, it's quite common for there to be a lot of negatives. So the cost of living is usually negatively affected in areas that, that are going to be facing these sorts of uh, developments. However, what we notice is that no mine has all ticks, no mine has all crosses, and we're really not able to just, uh, it, it certainly would be very inadequate to just add up all the ticks and all the crosses and think we had a sum of what the val potential value in addition to the assets of a region could be from any one mine. So now the, the other lessons that I want to um, just touch on relate to actually the upper Hunter Valley of New South Wales. So uh, primarily a coal mining area. Useful for this because it's an area of very intensive uh, development extractive industries development over a long period of time, uh, always good ones to, to look at when we're wanting to uh, take ourselves into the future on the basis of the lessons we can learn from the past. Um, so it's mainly this area between Singleton and Muzzlebrook. And uh, it's a, uh, oops, sorry, yeah, so there we go mainly a coal mining area and again you can see that the, the map of their area so those are coal mining uh, leases and so on but doesn't look dissimilar to yours with a, a whole patch of um, leases and holdings there with, with uh, quite a few mines um, dotted around it so it's, a, it's an area covered by three shires a smaller population uh, than the Bowen Basin, certainly, and um, it's northwest of Sydney. You can see the statistics there for yourself. Main towns, Muzzlebrooks, Singleton, Camberwell, very small now. Mm. And we want to know, well, what has been the footprint of having intensive coal mining, in their case, uh, there for a number of years? And I'm drawing on work that's been done by, by my colleagues, um, Chris Moran, David Brereton, and so on, uh, over a number of years down there. So it, in this area, the, the uh, drag lines, the black drag lines are existing coal mines, the red are proposed. The shaded area is where the um, leases and, and uh, coal mining holdings can extend over. And you can see that they coexist with green horses, Equine, the equine industry is big there, and with purple grapes, wineries. There's, there's quite a few wineries there. So it's an area where there are competing land uses in that way, similar particularly to, to our Darling Downs and some of the sorts of things John was talking about starting to happen there. Uh, I'll skip quickly over this because this one's picking up on labour impacts and we've heard a bit about that already today, but this is really doing a comparison on how mining and agricultural industries in this region have, have impacted for the different um, shires. Well, basically, we can see both industry sectors are providing jobs. Both industry sectors also provide the very important indirect and induced employment um, that their presence is, is connected to. In fact, as an example of that, 27% of Upper Hunter businesses rely on providing support services to the mining industry. So John's point about it, it can be in that supply chain that the opportunities lie, rather than in opportunities for synergies and so on, rather than in direct employment or job sharing across industries. And I've just thrown in this figure, in, in these shires, Still, almost 20% of people engage in voluntary work. I've thrown that in because one of the things we commonly hear people being afraid of and, um, and concerned about is that some of the, the, the social capital, the activities that happen because you're a community and the, and the community is holding together and people are working together, so the football clubs and the pony clubs and the... Um, local fate and all of those sorts of things, people are afraid that they'll drop off in areas with a lot of resource activity. 
20% is above the state average for uh, New South Wales. So there, there are at least some countering factors that are keeping that aspect of, um, of the social activity uh, fairly reasonably healthy. So, but what we really know is that mining creates jobs and it has given, in, in this case, over 10,000 extra jobs over a decade. Uh, it's set to create even more jobs going forward. It certainly increases employment opportunities for young people and can, to some extent, stop, stop the drift of young people to cities in the, in the hopes of um, challenging, high paying, whatever kinds of jobs. It provides some off-farm employment that can uh, be an important supplement to keep uh, farm incomes uh, eased out across the peaks and troughs of another kind of a cyclical industry and so on. But there's definitely unequal potential to compete between mining and employment and other industries. So your wages go too high for other people to be able to employ, whether it's the, the local uh, farms or whether it's the local hairdresser or coffee shop, to be able to provide jobs at the same sort of compensation. And surplus labour gets either absorbed into the mining industry or pushed out of the region because it can't afford the accommodation and the high, higher costs of living. living. So there becomes considerable difficulty in recruiting and retaining staff for a lot of essential community services jobs. But one comment we've had from our field work is somebody saying, well, not everyone can work for the mines, but we end up having to employ, not my words, the drongos and the drug addicts because everybody else can get a job with the mines. Um, the other issue that's been touched on a lot, the uneven spread of the benefits. So yes, some people are going to earn high incomes, and in fact some of these areas, again I think some of CQU's research shows that some of these areas are among the most, e most highly paid and most equal kinds of salaries. Because if you're not earning that kind of salary, you can't afford to live there. So we don't find big disparities in wages often, but it is... You do, you do have to read between the lines on those things. So mining employees are, employees are contributing, to, obviously, to the, the region, um, and, the, and the region is also contributing to royalties and things like that. But as we've said, um, we've seen plenty of figures that, that show that that is not equally spread in terms of individuals within a community or in terms of the various communities around a region or a state. And um, the royalties for region issue is, of course, trying regions issue and, and proposal is trying to pick up on that and think of some way to, to redress some of that uneven spread. But as with many things, there can be catch-22s around a lot of schemes. And of course, the West Australian Royalties for Regions program was not to uh, return royalties to the region where they were generated, unlike the proposal from LGIQ and, and so on in Queensland. The, the West Australian one returns it to the regions, including non-mining regions. And uh, of course, we could debate whether, well, should the ones who happen to be sitting on the stuff be the best, or should we make it something that benefits all of our regional areas? And those issues are some of the um, things that our, our um, policy makers have to decide. But again, from the research, somebody tells us, mining is beneficial because of the relatively high income for mine workers, but it also provides a gap between the miners and the lower income earners. The local economy is geared for the mine workers, for example, rent, house prices, etc. And we talk also about the impacts on infrastructure and services. So there's, you know, a, a very big New England highway straight through this area of the Hunter Valley. There's a, a lot of, you know, a strong railway network. It's got big power, coal-fired power stations, both to use the local stuff, but also because they're using lots of power, power there. There's schemes been developed to, to reuse mine water, um, and, and uh, there's 
plenty of protection being possible and uh, innovative things happening with sites of heritage significance to try and retain the cultural heritage as well. But there are the downsides of those same pressures like on housing infrastructure, on health services, um, education services and so on. And then the staffing of those health education services plus the community services and the maintenance of community networks and, and family life with the various things that accompany um, this sort of development, including things like the shifts that we've talked about and the pressures that they put on family life can all be taken into account. Um, so again, we can, we can see that there is a balance. There's some opportunities but also some challenges when you, as far as infrastructure development associated with resource development. Um, and a, a quote that says, the mines provide scholarships and traineeships for our young students and we have them to thank for our pool, the PCYC, hospital upgrades and the cycling velodrome. They've helped the show association, the pistol club and the youth homelessness service, as well as local service clubs, charities and arts societies. They invest a lot here. But equally, there's plenty of criticism that this sort of sponsorships and donations programs by uh, resource companies is not a sustainable way to build the assets of the, of the place over the longer term. And finally, the impacts on identity and the so psychosocial impacts that I talked about. And again, we've seen issues where people's concerns are rising up, where communities, we've all heard the anecdotes about communities becoming po polarised. There's certainly research that shows the feelings that people have when their properties are, um, as they feel it, intruded on, or their sense of powerlessness in the face of developments that they are not yet comfortable with uh, develops. Feelings of anger, stress, loss, desolation, things that really do relate to mental health concerns. And certainly one researcher down in the, in, not from our centre, but one researcher down in the Hunter Valley there has talked about this notion of solastalgia. A, 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 it's, it's related to nostalgia, but it means I've stayed where I am, but I'm, I don't, I feel like it's not the way it should be, the not the way it used to be. So when, we, when we're feeling nostalgic, we're thinking back, ah, oh, the good old days, or something like that. This is the feeling of things have changed and I don't like the, the pace, the nature, etc., of the change. So that changing community identity is a very real issue in many areas where rapid change is occurring. It doesn't have to be associated with these kinds of industries. But just at the moment, that is the cause of a lot of rapid change in our society. So those effects can manifest in community opposition and a lot of uh, direct action that we're starting to see in ways that we're per we perhaps are not familiar with or that are involving people who haven't been involved in those sorts of ways previously. So those social changes are a real issue to be contended with when we're thinking about what's happening to the society and the, the social capital. So um, just to yeah, sum up those sorts of issues of, again, the natural capital, what do we really want? We want re the resource development to link to sustainable development. The resource value has to be transformed into enhancement of our various assets if we want to talk about it as a kind of uh, addition to regional value. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you.